Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights Podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long. And now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom Aleichem, Jim. How are you? Shalom, Rabbi. Doing very well. Guess yeah. who's coming at uh, the end of the week, though? Um, let me see. I can't. I, I've forgotten if I knew. It's the month of Elul. Elul. The, the king will be Elul. in the field. Exactly. The king, the king, will king be is in the, in the field. Is yeah. a beautiful expression attributed to one of our holy rabbis that that expresses the the unique spiritual opportunity and dynamic of the upcoming month of Elul. So this is the last week of the month of the Consoling Father, Menachem Av. This Shabbat and Sunday, August 27th and 28th, will be Rosh Chodesh Elul. And it is honestly such an exciting... I, I, I chuckle because I know that I, I, um, I say this a lot every year, and I have been for many, many years, and it's always true. It's always new. And it's always a time for people to really grab hold of themselves and realize, I can change. It's a Dylan line. I can change, I swear. And it really is an opportunity that Hashem is giving us to become a completely different person. Elul stands for Song of Songs, Chapter 6, Ani Lidodi Lidodi Lidodi. It's on your wedding ring, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the real beloved is Hashem. Amen. So I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. And I make that first move. I am to my beloved, and I want to return to him. And I and I want to review the past year and begin to prepare my heart and my life for the upcoming awesome days of awe, which is Tishrei, the month of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, the 10 days of repentance, Yom Kippurim, Sukkot, it's such an unbelievably beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time of year. And although the entire year is um, perfectly worthy of repentance and uh, it's always welcome, but yet there's something very, very special about these days that it, there, it's just a certain kind of, of um, uh, what should we say, a certain kind of um, pre pre preload preset that mm -hmm. that that the the feelings of repentance are easier to generate and to be sincere and for us to really think deeply about where our lives are going during these days yeah the ground is being prepared it's being broken exactly. up yeah it's a it's a time of renewal it's a time of of deep uh, introspection and that is so exciting because the very experience of the Hebrew calendar is a rendezvous with ourselves, with destiny, with our lives that are as yet unfolding. Hashem being the architect of our lives, He knows exactly what kind of inspiration we need at what type, at what time of year. And it's like living, living for Hashem. It's 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 amazing, you know, an amazing process. Yeah. And as we get ready for this upcoming time. We also see these topics kind of reflected in the Torah portions. And there's a beautiful idea that even the names of the Torah portions that we're going to be reading over the next couple of weeks, they they reflect this kind of um, insight, this kind of idea and inspiration beginning next week. So we'll have a lot to talk about. But in the meantime, this week's Torah portion of Parshat Re'eh, beginning in chapter 11 and verse 26 of the book of Deuteronomy begins with a blessing and a curse, but re'e, the word re'e, the first word of the parsha, is seeing. Seeing, exactly. Moshe so, Rabbeinu yeah. says, see, that's the first word of the parsha, see. I present before you today a blessing and a curse, and of course, the blessing is that you shall hearken to the commandments of Hashem your God that I command you today. And the curse is if you, if you don't hearken to them. And they're actually... Um, they are actually said over later on in chapter 27 when the people are facing the two mountains, Mount Abel and Mount Gerizim. It's odd, isn't it, Jim, that that the language that introduces this Torah portion is a language of vision because, uh, because the blessing and the curse, it's like it's a spiritual concept. It's true. They'll be manifest in your lives. But why does Moshe say, see, <laughs> why does he say, See, look, yeah. I'm holding them up in front of you. You can right. see them. Right. You know, I love gematria. And the, the gematria for the word re is 206, 206. It's also the same gematria for the word devar. 
meaning thing or word, your understanding of a thing or a concept is aided by the visual aspect of it. Not only to see, but to observe these commandments. Hashem is always presenting Israel as they have these experiences with what can best be described in the most mundane way as God's visual aids. They're going to go and they're going to stand before these two mountains. And I thought about why mountains? Why did he choose two different mountains? Mountain is a metaphor for being elevated. When there is a mountain that in front testimony of you, that's there forever also. It's there forever. Like Moshe says in Parshat Hazin, you, know, you know, they're the heavens and the earth are going to be witnesses because they're, they're here. They're, yes, so they, exactly. They witness all of this. It's, uh, the mountain has different sides to it, so everybody can go up a different path, meaning whatever innate talent that he's given you, that's the path you've taken up the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I'll finish it off with this, this heavily metaphorical idea, is that as you ascend, your perspective changes. You begin to understand more because you see more. So all of these beautiful ideas that you're sharing fit in with that word. So it's definitely a, a signal and mm -hmm. a very specific, uh, very uh, intended um, beginning of the Parsha. I think also that, you know, everything real really boils down to free choice. You know, that free choice, Jim, Bechira, is the probably the most important concept really in in all of torah you know the, the the most important principle the idea that that we all have the ability to choose our path you know that hashem doesn't push us that we have the the opportunity to become whoever we want to become you know and then you know we, we we've been talking about the, the james webb images and we were talking about the incredible vastness of creation and then the concept of the tzimtzum you know the fact that hashem within all of this vast creation needed to create a place wherein the world can exist and withdraw himself ever so slightly so that people do not see clearly but ha but see enough to be able to exercise their free choice which and everything is is everything is about free choice the ability of us to choose between right and wrong that's Ever since Adam, that's what everything here is is all about. But I think that one of the illusions that that Moshe is giving us with Re in this parsha is that we can actually see ourselves if we care to see. We can see the manifestation. We can see the consequences. We can see the difference between right and wrong. We can see the difference between the blessing and the curse. It's everywhere. It's in our own lives that we can look and see. And so it really is a, a kind of like a, a vision thing in a way. And, and it's in the details. It's in the details of everything. You know, we, we live in a world that is finite. And we are finite people. But Hashem is endless. And His creation is endless. And yet, even though He is the sum total of reality, He's the Creator. He is everything. And so how do we serve him? You know, how do we live our lives? And then we look in Torah and there's all these details. There's so many details. Uh, and, what, you know, people sometimes say to me, you know, like, like, for example, in this week's Torah portion, we have the many laws of kashrut, you mm -hmm. know, which animals may be eaten, which animals should not be eaten, all sorts of issues about, about, um, uh, sanctified food and sanctified food that has to be eaten in, in, in uh, Jerusalem. And there's the whole concept of the, the um, prohibitions against idolatry. There's so so many details to a, a Torah based life, and and many times people say like, why why is God who has no beginning and no end? Why does He care about the details? And some people even get very arrogant about it. And they say, huh, you think you know God? You really think He cares? Like what what shoe you put on first and what you eat and how you eat it? And He doesn't care about those things. But the fact he, is, He does. Yeah. He most certainly does. Yeah, he most yeah. certainly does care because everything that we do is ha, has tremendous repercussions and creates waves of energy, and we are connected in amazing ways to all of creation and to each other. And 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 nothing it goes um, for naught. And so, even though we live in a world that is literally endless, 
we ourselves are are finite beings, and within the the the, the borders, the confines of our own humanity, Hashem has given us these mitzvot, which are literally threads of light. They're like conduits by which we can connect to the infinite. Mm-hmm. It's just the most amazing thing. But whether or not we do is completely up to us. Yeah. And, but if we look, we can see the difference between between uh, right and wrong. One of the first things that that uh, or actually the first commandment really that we are given in the parasha after the intro- the introduction of the concept of the blessing and the curse that's going to be given later on in chapter 27, right away um, we read in the beginning of chapter 12, these are the decrees and the ordinances that you shall observe to perform in the land that Hashem, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess it all the days that you live on the land. And then, Jim, we have this very uh, uh, kind of um, uncomfortable Comfortable command, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations that you are driving away worship their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every leafy tree. You shall break apart their altars, you shall smash their pillars, and their sacred trees shall you burn in the fire. Their carved images shall you cut down, and you shall obliterate their names from that place. In other words, Israel's commanded to come into the land and basically purge it of all remnants of the pagan um, approaches to spirituality, all the idolatry. And it's this commandment is extremely um, politically incorrect. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it, is the, it is Israel's main task in the world, destroying idolatry, certainly in her own land. And then also back in, back in um, Numbers, in chapter 22, right? Um, there's an amazing thing that when um, Balak was confronted with the reality that the children of Israel were on their way into the, into the land. So we find here in the beginning of Parshat Balak, this verse that's also very difficult to understand. Moab said to the elders of Midian, now the congregation will lick up our entire surroundings as an ox licks up the greenery of the field. Mm-hmm. Why? What? It, why is that the metaphor that he uses? An ox. What does he care? This congregation of Israel that exited Egypt is on their way to their own land, but they're going to lick up our entire surroundings as an ox licks up the greenery of the field. And so Rashi explains that an ox has a very muscular tongue, and when the ox eats the the greenery from the field, it actually pulls it up by the roots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is so amazing. This metaphor is so deep. What basically what what Balak is saying is that the children of Israel are going to uh, embark upon their national destiny, which is to uproot idolatry, to pull it up. But and that's why he's saying he's they're going to they're going to uh, uproot our surroundings like an ox uproots the greenery, and we're no longer going to be able to get away with all the. Uh, the chicanery that we get away with, the, the smoke and mirrors, the man behind the curtain. We're we're in control now. We're we're making everybody think that we're that we're God. That we're we're making the gods. We're we're in control, and it's an illusion. But now they're going to come, and they are the Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. and they are going to put us out of business. We can't have that. That is the um, job description of what Israel is supposed to do. Is we're supposed to uproot idolatry, and that's the main task. And therefore, we find this this uh, command in the beginning of chapter 12 of Parshat Re'eh, that you have to destroy all this idolatry from your land. And so I say that is that is extremely not woke in the world that we live in today. For, for, for us to have this in the Torah, for Hashem to say to Israel, you have to destroy all the idolatry. It is basically saying that someone else's lifestyle has no place in my world, in Hashem's world on my watch. It cannot be tolerated. And that is so the opposite of, you know, of what they call woke, which basically being woke is like, everybody's okay. And no one can be criticized. That is, unless you disagree with me, unless you disagree with this position, no one can be be criticized because everybody is, I'm okay. You're okay. But the, but what Torah is saying here is not everything is okay. And again, it's describing here a culture war. Describing here a situation that there is, that there are things that are evil, they cannot be tolerated. But again, 
it really does get back to free choice. It gets back to what people want in their lives and the choices that they make regarding how they are going to, um, in what direction they're going to go. Everything that we are reading about in this Parsha, in the Torah in general, but mm-hmm. here in this Parsha, if, you know, if I had to stand on one foot and describe what, what the scenario is that Moshe Rabbeinu is laying out for the people of Israel and that Israel in turn is to teach the world, I would say it's about developing a sensitivity. Because everything here, even, again, I, like a person could say, w- w- why the details? Who, why do you have to get lost in these details? If you, you know, God is forever. God is love. God is truth. God has no borders. Why do you, why do you think he cares what you eat? But the world is very complex, and everything, everything in it is very complex. And Hashem sets up a, a scenario in which we are faced with choices and which he gives us the ability, the, literally the keys, to be able to um, bring his presence into the world, to be able to shine light ever stronger. And that is exactly what the mitzvot are all about. And so here he gives us a diet, which is completely spiritual in nature. And in this Torah portion, he also differentiates between, these are many verses that people don't understand what's going on here, where it, where, where it talks about the difference between sanctified meat and then when your Hashem will broaden your borders, the Parsha tells us, and you will and you will have a desire to eat meat. So you're allowed to eat meat as you desire it. And the differentiation that he's making is between the meat that was brought as part of an offering, because mm-hmm. until now the children of Israel were surrounding the tabernacle and it wasn't very far from the tabernacle. And so an offering could be brought, and then the the person who brings it, the owner, could have a portion of that. But later, when you're he's going to be broadening your borders and you're going to be living further from the tabernacle and then there's going to be such a thing as being able to eat meat of course in a kosher manner kosher mm-hmm. meat that's slaughtered properly etc etc but it's not it's not going to be sanctified and therefore he says also a person who's pure also a person who's impure is going to be able to eat from that meat and all of these rules that he that he is giving also it is a worldview that mm-hmm. has to do with developing a a, a, a total sensitivity to everything around us. The, the, the Torah is not commanding a person to eat meat. The Torah is allowing a person who is who is uh, feeling a desire to eat meat within reason and to and 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 um, conducted correctly according to the the the, the concepts of of, of Torah. Mm-hmm. The person is allowing uh, the Torah is allowing that person to eat meat. That doesn't mean that it is the best case scenario at all. Right. That doesn't mean that 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 doesn't mean that Torah is a is foreseeing a situation that we've arrived at today, wherein, unfortunately, in order to keep up with the demand that people have for meat, unfortunately, it's become a, it's become, even in the, in the world of kosher meat, to some extent, it's become an industry in which uh, there's, there's not enough regard that's given to the way the animals are kept and raised, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Even as a nullchide, one of the seven laws is that we're supposed to pay attention to how uh, an animal is treated, even up to the point where it's slaughtered, because we're not supposed to eat the limb of a living animal. And if you kill an animal while it's still alive, then you the, the meat is considered unfit. If you begin, for... if you begin to um, to dismember the animal while yeah. while it is still in death throes, which unfortunately happens very, very often when yeah. meat is mass produced, then then that person inadvertently is actually going to be transgressing that. An animal that is in in, in death throes or, or even in fear, that's in, gripped in, in fear, releases toxins into the flesh. The the issue that I'm that I'm raising is the fact that the amount that is produced today makes it very, very difficult. Um, the circumstances make it very, very difficult because it is it has become an industry that that is difficult to monitor. So yeah. I'm saying kosher meat is it, kosher meat is the best way to go. I think for a noahide as well to make sure that that they're not transgressing their concept of the limb from a living animal. But there is a certain hyper level of sensitivity that Torah is encouraging in terms of understanding really the 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 sanctity of all life. And not taking it for granted, and that's what this whole system is really meant to encourage us to think deeper about about our relationship with the whole world, with everything around us. Amen. Yeah, it all it all comes down to that to this concept of being 
as sensitive as we can to all of creation and the purpose of human life altogether, which is to find Hashem in everything. And, you, you know, again, getting, getting back to the, you know, every week that goes by since our program in which we discussed the, you know, we did a program the first week that the James Webb Telescope began to transmit images. And so since then, a couple of weeks later, there have been more and more beautiful images that have been shared with the whole world as far as going further and further back and light years and closer and closer to what they're calling the cosmic dawn, you know, and and the beginning of time, so to speak, and more and more beautiful, breathtaking images that point towards the handiwork of a of a creator. And that basically inspires us to, you know, to remember what the purpose of Hashem's creation was. And the thing is, there's, you know, more and more technological advancement. We are seeing more and more technological breakthrough every day. And yet at the same time, it seems that the world altogether is plunging deeper and deeper into a, a moral abyss. It's such a strange kind of, of um, you know, um, equation, because at the same time that they're, that, that uh, technologically speaking, there has never been a generation like this where there is so much amazing, amazing breakthrough in science. And yet at the same time, there's terrible, terrible breakdown of the divine image in which man was created. And you know that there, when I talk like this, it's because there's something bothering me. So we'll get there. But it's almost as if like Torah, in these Torah portions especially, is describing a vision of a society that maybe you could use the word utopian because Hashem wants us to have as as close as possible to a perfected society. And that's the purpose of, of all of the commandments that he gives us to to strive to live in a in a perfected society well, and the opposite of that as we all know is the word dystopian dystopia which is basically used to describe an imaginary society that seems to be coming true all around us which is basically dehumanizing and controlled and bad because of whether it's oppression or terror or or human misery you know um, that seems to be exactly kind of like the the um, pendulum that we that we're witnessing mm -hmm. now, almost like the edge of the of, of a precipice of 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 this pull between yeah. this vision for what humanity is supposed to be and a growing kind of like um, almost frenetic pace march towards this pit of of dystopia. Which of course sounds exactly like before the flood. So we're living in this in this tinsel, right, Jim? We're living in this place that Hashem created in in quantum life, you know, mm -hmm. quantum space and time, in order for us to be able to make a, a, a free choice about how we want to live our lives, because free choice is so important. And in the meantime, um, this there's this this theme of of a very kind of like negative. Uh, take on reality, a very, very dystopian kind of of um, atmosphere. It's being nurtured and encouraged and and um, advanced by all sorts of forces. Hollywood, for example, like all the disaster movies, all the movies about the end of the world and about and about uh, literally about the end of the world that are so popular today. Why? Why is it that people enjoy that kind of thing? What, what does it do for them? That it's, that's become like a major, for years now, that's like a major theme in entertainment is instead of like a hopeful vision of world peace and harmony and and um, the unity of all humanity, it's, all, it's always about the end of the world. So here, here is that, you know, I follow these scientific pronouncements and, and um, news items. It's, it's very intriguing to me how I, I see all of this in in Torah unfolding, you know, before our eyes. So there's a new study now that that came out and the and the uh, this week. And it's uh it's it's describing the process of planetary engulfment. So planetary engulfment, which is apparently common in the life cycle of star systems, is is something that is being put forward now that claims that at one point in time the sun is going to devour the earth also Mercury and Venus, but it's going to totally destroy 
the earth. And even though the scientists who are basically only undergraduate stu students, but yet they've, they've uh, put forward this idea and it's getting a lot of play. They've said that basically 5 billion years from now, the sun is going to lose its powers and become a red giant that's going to swallow up the earth and earth is going to meet its end because the sun is already uh, basically a reach middle age. The whole, na the whole character of this, of this paper is basically that we're on a time clock now and we're heading towards the end of, of the world because here's the, here's the quotation. For the case of the earth, I think it's rather unclear whether it's going to be engulfed or not, but it's certainly going to become impossible to live on. And all of this is, um, I think, important to understand because it's, all, it's also the opposite of a Torah-based philosophy of man being the center of creation, of Hashem's being the creator and being in charge and being and being uh, and the plan for 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 humanity but again this 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 kind of like this like this itch like this this direction that is that is um utilized and employed in so many different realms that is basically trying to prepare mankind whether consciously or subliminally or through entertainment or through science to to the, to this very very dystopian view of of life and the future of mankind it comes from a mindset that says abandon all you know hope, hope ye who enter here yes enter, yeah because they that, they that don't was what have, was written in dante's inferno over it's, the, it's another way of saying this is it this is all there is at the same time that 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 that's one of the motivations mm -hmm. right yeah. the hopelessness the brother the companion of that is nothingness because nothing matters you know ostensibly on 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 the surface maybe the theme of all of the of all of this thinking and all of this science and all of this entertainment is disaster coming you know or at the end of the world at some at some point but i think that the disaster is really now mm -hmm. i think that that i think that that so many aspects of the dissolution of the human condition and the divine image in which man was created with for which Hashem has big plans. I think it's all being eaten up with decay and rotted from the inside because there is a deliberate agendaized movement to devalue life, to devalue oh, yeah. human life, to cast a pall over hope really to be, to be hopeless. And, and let me just interject one thought now before I forget it, because Someone wrote uh, on um, a YouTube comment on, I think, last week's uh, podcast, someone wrote the following. Someone wrote a comment. I understand the political climate of the state of affairs of Israel. However, I would like the program to stay on scripture and explain the Parsha in the, con in the context, and not deviate so much into world affairs. Shalom. So hmm. I just want to well. say about that. <laughs> I, I just want to say that uh, I think I speak for you as well, Jim, but you're here, you can speak for yourself, that um, I don't see any difference between world affairs and Torah. It's it, it, it's all Torah. It's it, Torah is not a um, shelf, a, 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 a study in a dusty book on the shelf. It is Torah Chaim. It is the Torah of life. It is the substance of our existence. And everything that we're discussing is a matter of life and death. And it's all Torah. So it is, in other words, you know, there is something to be said for delving into scripture for its own sake, which we do all the time, which is what our Zoom classes are about. And something very, very beautiful to be a student of Torah and to and to want to understand every dimension in the in the context of of the of the scripture. But that's actually what we're doing, because there is no exception to the to the rule. And, and everything that is part and parcel of our lives and the human condition, the human experience is all resonating within within Torah. So I think that's our entire goal in discussing the things that are important and issues of the day and things that that we are all facing. It's because Torah has a position about all of these things because it's Hashem. It's Hashem's world, and it's and we are called upon to again to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil, and it's all about free choice. And everything yeah. and a student of Torah has to appreciate the fact that it's it's not just a, a, a book. It's not just a study. It's it's life itself. So as soon as I read about, and as soon as we saw the James Webb images and began to and began to appreciate the concept of looking back 
so many light years being tantamount to looking back in time and the whole uh, purpose-driven goal of of that project to to try and actually witness the beginning of creation that is something that could ignite a whole global chuva movement it's so beautiful the whole right. concept of of looking towards the beginning of creation and so too as soon as i read about this idea of planetary engulfment and the proposition that the sun is going to destroy the earth my reaction uh, was that this is very very anti-torah because hashem who created the world and who loves man has his plan for all of humanity. It's not something that we are supposed to be worried about. The sun losing its hydrogen and, and its border and expanding hundreds of times over and, and engulfing the earth. So um, that is um, basically the basis of everything that, that we are striving for is to understand that Torah's, the Torah's take on life and how, it fits in with our lives and what we're facing in these in these days. Like we're coming up to the month of Elul now, and it's all about realignment and reassessing and understanding what our goals are in this world. So we began talking about the concept of um, this extremely politically incorrect mitzvah that our Parsha instructs Israel to destroy idolatry, which again is, is Israel's main task, not only in her own land, but in the whole world to be able to say this is not okay this is cannot be tolerated evil cannot be tolerated and the denial of the creator cannot be tolerated so we like to share our our emails and um i got an, an inquiry this week and the inquiry was requesting my response to try and explain the Torah's position about something that's been going on and reported on lately uh, a lot that's been in the news, and that is the concept of what's called, um, what's it called, Jim? Gender dysphoria. Gen gender dysphoria, but more than yeah. that, gen gender as gender reassignment, reassignment surgery. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gender reassignment surgery. The yeah. the reason that I that I'm bringing this up is because. There is a popular um, podcast in um, in coming from Boston, Massachusetts, right? And there's a whole scandal that was that's been in the news lately uh, concerning the Boston Children's Hospital, which is a um, an important uh, medical institution in that area. And it was regarding um, apparently surgery that had been performed on young children and children yeah. below the age of eighteen. Yeah. And then it came to light, and they and they changed it, and there was so it, it and then and then apparently the, the 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 Boston Children's Hospital began receiving allegedly receiving threats and what was described as hateful <laughs> hateful comments and hateful reactions from people, so that the mayor of Boston. Uh, made made this whole statement about how listen this is this is medical treatment, this is medical treatment. Yeah. Um, looking into a little bit, uh, uh, of course, um, not knowing how much this is prevalent, and look into a little bit, and I see that I don't know. I don't think Boston is the only place where this is available. No. I think that the surgery is available in many many places in America. I saw it in Chicago, in Ohio, in in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure in other countries as well. But the concept of um, it's one thing if a person makes a decision that they, for whatever reason, want to change their gender. I'll talk about that as well. But the idea of uh, having this assignment, this this surgery, gender reassignment surgery on young children, it really seems very, very horrible, horrible to me. Whenever we talk about this subject, gender dysphoria, you and I, we always frame it uh, within what we understand from the, our sages of blessed memory and their insights into the Torah. You mentioned the generation of the flood. Generation of the flood was notoriously licentious and also full of all sorts of, um, shall we say, mis misguided sexual energy. Mm -hmm. And Chazal, our sages in the Midrash, tell us some really, really uh, horrific things about society in the time of the flood and, and and what the manifestation of that society was that caused Hashem 
to come to the conclusion that he had to do a total reset on the whole world because things were so bad. So, for example, our sages talk about how people actually had marriages with animals in which they actually drew up to both marriage contracts right. with animals. It talks about how they developed a certain kind of clothing style that actually showed their genitals in public. It talks about how they would swap wives, all sorts of things um, that, you know, are very stark and, and, and very disquieting. But this kind of thing, the, in the especially in the in the, to the degree that we see in our society today, I don't think there's any sort of parallel description in any of the generations to to this kind of um, movement. You know, of 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 um, making a decision that I am the wrong, that my body is is not right for me, that I this is not who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't think that to the, to the certainly to the extent that this exists today, that it ever that it has any sort of parallel in human history, and one wonders where it's coming from. You have to wonder about a movement that is constantly screaming at us that you need to follow the science, and yet they ignore the science. This is where I'm going. So there was this very popular call-in show in Boston, and the host was talking about. Uh, all of this going on in the in the and this whole um, hoopla going on with the Boston Children's Hospital, and so uh, I was asked to uh, write to this radio host and um, and try to um, write up a, a kind of a comment in the name of the Torah, a rabbinical comment. What is the is the Jewish position on this whole thing? Whether or not he read the email on uh, online and whether or not it was part of a broadcast, I do not know. But this is the letter that I wrote for that for that program. This is what I wrote. Um, I want to state unequivocally that this is totally forbidden by the Torah of Israel and by Jewish law. No false logic, reasoning, excuse, agenda, etc. can possibly be used to declare this as permissible. I'm talking here about gender reassignment surgery on young children, right? It is, rep it is a reprehensible unraveling, like committing an act of wanton terror, aimed at destroying the divine image in which men and women were created. Aside from all the psychological and spiritual damage that it wreaks on a soul, it is also a symptom of a society run amok, sunken in an abyss of raw, pagan, misguided, and selfish sexual energy, much as society at the time of the Great Flood is described in the writings of the ancient sages of Israel, and for which that generation was punished with utter destruction for the sake of a divine reset. That is the, the letter that I wrote. So I want to make it very, very clear that th we're not talking here about not being accepting of a person's feelings or welcoming or anything like that, and let no one misconstrue these remarks as being hateful. I'm trying to to make it clear what our holy Torah um, reflects as far as wh who we are as people, right? So, so uh, I'm not here about not not accepting someone and not welcoming something. I'm 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 commenting on how there is an agenda driven, media fueled, government backed movement within society that is basically victimizing yeah. an entire generation, Jim. And that is how I feel about, about these children and about adults as well that are going through this because back in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14, when Pharaoh was dealing harshly with the children of Israel, our sages very astutely comment that the, that the harsh labor that he gave Israel in the beginning was that he gave men women's jobs to do and, and, and women men's jobs to do and this is a, a uh, an allusion to the first gender dysphoria that was being described basically in the scripture, which is yeah. that he knew very well. But what was Pharaoh's goal? Pharaoh's goal in the destruction of the house of Israel in the beginning of Exodus, right, was to totally destroy the family unit. Yeah. And so he, the first st step before he began throwing the babies into the Nile, the first step of that Holocaust was to destroy psychologically the family unit by by creating uh, confusion, and so and so when these adults who have their own again their own agenda their own their own uh, worldview when they encourage children 
to doubt themselves, it is it is such a tremendous crime. And it's like, I don't know if there's ever been a precedent in history for what we're facing now. And certainly, I think this is a lot worse than it was in the generation of the flood. And it's like a, some sort of genie has been let out of a bottle. And to me, and this is why, you know, I, I slid into all of this from the earlier comments about the utopia versus dystopia, about the Torah's vision for a world that is based on um, bringing Hashem's light into the world and living according to the, our within our human boundaries to be able to create a, a just society. This is like, the, a, a, almost like a, not almost, I think, I think this is motivated to destroy civilization to destroy the continuum of civilization of, of civilization. Yeah. And so and so everyone who is who is involved in this, I think, uh, is is a victim, a victim of the, of this tremendous scam that is being perpetrated by, by these forces of evil. I mean, it did children to encourage them to doubt themselves at, at a time when they are so vulnerable. And, and first of all, the sexuality in Torah. In Torah's viewpoint and the mindset of, of Torah, as Hashem communicates to us, is sexuality is the biggest area of a test for a person. That's why there are so many laws in Torah that relate to relations and, and when is it permitted and when is it forbidden and to whom is it, between which which people is it permitted because it is the, the, the uh, opening to absolute uh, disaster or... It is the greatest imitation of godliness and and bringing life into the world. And the fact is, you know, uh, any any person at any age can have all sorts of feelings, sexual feelings, because human beings are sexual beings, and they're fluid feelings. And at different times in a person's life and under different circumstances, a person might have this feeling or that feeling, and a person might have same sex, sex attraction, and a person might feel that a man might feel feminine and a woman might feel masculine. But you know what? Feelings are feelings. And just because the person has those feelings doesn't mean that it's who they are. It means that they are feeling fluid, and it means that they, that they uh, are being tested, and it means that they are in a situation that they have to that they have to watch themselves it doesn't mean that they have to act on it and in fact that's the difference between a, a, like the torah's presentation of yosef joseph is described as yosef hatzadik he's one of the only people that's described in torah as being righteous he has the appellation of forever of yosef hatzadik in the literature of torah and yet when he was tempted with his master's wife he went very very far yeah. He went very, very far, according to our simple understanding of of that day, that there was no one home, and that his and that his master's wife fi finally succeeded in seducing him, and then he ran out and left the garment in his hands. He was ready. He even crept up onto the bed with her, but then he saw an image of his father in his mind, and he cooled down, and he ran off, and he sanctified Hashem's name, and he left the garment in her in her hand, and because of that, he was sent to prison. But the point is, it's not that he wasn't tempted; it's that he didn't he didn't act on it, and so. Right. And the Torah is teaching us a deep, deep lesson here because some people think that a righteous person doesn't have feelings, doesn't have doesn't have trials, isn't tested. But Torah teaches us through the example of Yosef, Joseph, that a tzaddik, a righteous person, is a regular person that has tests and feelings, but he doesn't act on them. He knows how to control himself. That's what a true tzaddik is. It's not that he's not a human being. It's that he's a human being who is in control of himself. That's what a true human being is. And so the thing is, when I when I talk about an agenda-driven, media-fueled, government-backed, societal, you know, pressure that's being brought against this generation of victims, just because a little child might gravitate towards a certain behavior or play with a certain doll or be attracted to a color that's associated with the other sex, doesn't does that warrant that the parents for their own reasons go and decide on this child's fate? It's just it's just an a, a, an unspeakable crime, you know, because because it, 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 even if a person, you know, if a, an adult felt a certain kind of sexual arousal, it doesn't mean that it has to be acted upon. And it certainly doesn't mean that it has to be nurtured. It's part of the entire process of being a, a human being. But to take little children who who can't practically express themselves who are still in such a vulnerable stage of development, certainly who can't vote, and to decide for them that this is who they're going to be, it seems to me that this is an organized movement of terror 
that is designed to bring about the destruction of humanity. Well, that's obvious. I mean, how do you build a world? The the first thing that Hashem says to Adam and Eve, a man and a woman, He says, "Be fruitful and exactly. multiply that and replenish so the earth." And after the, the very flood, first recorded statement that Hashem made to Adam when He created yeah. him was, He didn't say hello. He didn't yeah. say kachavas. He didn't say. He said, "Be fruitful and multiply." That's what human sexuality is for. That is Hashem's purpose in the world is for us to bring forth generations. Mm -hmm. And after the flood, when when Noah and his sons and their wives came out of the ark, Hashem said to them the same thing, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. If they had all decided that they didn't feel like men and women anymore by the time they got out of the ark a year later, none of us would be here. We have to ask ourselves, what yeah. happens to a world that is systematically negating the purpose of human existence? Um, Balak hired Bilam. He said, you've got to destroy these people. How do we do it? He basically said, you've got to destroy their family unit. So that's the thing that keeps Israel together. It's the glue. Again, he, he learned from Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Back from originally when he started to, to give those kind of jobs to the children of Israel, just to render them utterly confused. In the UK, the National Institute of Health has shut down a major gender identity clinic called Tavistock. And the reason it was shut down after decades, Rabbi, is because mental health specialists, Psychiatrists, doctors, parents, teachers came out of the woodwork, whistleblowers, lawsuits followed because they were doing gender reassignment to children, and they were doing it in spite of any real evidence other than what people felt about their identity. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is pushing the trans agenda on children, despite an FDA warning they're having they're giving kids drugs. Right, that block their development. In, how, could, in how could a child have any self awareness or knowledge at that age when everything is confusing? Well, I apologize to our, our viewer who asked why we go off on these topics of uh, world affairs. But the fact is, this is Torah. We are reaching out to a generation that is searching for Hashem. And again, th it's, this is a generation that is being. Uh, held at at gunpoint, held at knife point by by this agenda, and and being made to feel well, maybe I'm not all right, maybe I'm not okay, maybe this is the, maybe this is really who I'm supposed to be, maybe this is who I'm supposed to be, and that is uh, something that is coming from a very dark place, coming from a a place that is that is designed to basically unravel Hashem's world, mm -hmm. and to show you how desperate these people are is that you can't disagree with them. Uh, you, you can't respectfully disagree with them and have a normal conversation without them characterizing it as hate. This is hate exactly. speech. Exactly. So, so, when, so when, when people that are called conservative or who are whatever they're called, people that are called conservative, people that are called religious, when they began to uh, um, react to what was going on in Boston, they uh, so, so the, the Boston Children's Hospital immediately went into this uh, state of um, damage control, exactly. Yeah, and they and they're saying you know they're being subjected to threats, and and maybe they were. I don't know, mm -hmm. but they're talking about all of this hatred that's being that's being um, poured on them, so that the so that the mayor of Boston had to come out and make a statement. What what what's wrong with you people? This is this is medical treatment. Yeah, to take yeah. a child who yeah. who doesn't even know the first thing about the difference between right and wrong or anything, and to say that the child's gender has to be changed. Is medical treatment? When I was a teenager and I was dealing with hormones, I I never heard any of this. None of us did that. Well, maybe you need to reassign your gender because I certainly had no confusion about what sex I was. If I had been vulnerable enough and was confused, uh, I would not have been greeted by a cacophony, a chorus of twisted voices telling me that, uh, well, maybe you need to change your sex. Maybe that's where all of your confusion is coming. And by the way, it's the thing right now. It's it's trendy. This is all so um, apropos, I think, to the to the scenario of the messianic redemption and the times leading up to it.
Mm-hmm. Honestly, because this is not a stretch. I mean, I, I'm I'm not one to speculate on when the Messiah is arriving at all, because I feel that that is not the most important approach in Torah. I feel the most important approach in Torah is for us to deal with every day that Hashem gives us to making ourselves into better people, making the world into a better place. When Hashem sends the, the Messiah is his business and his promise. The thing is, though, that when you study the ancient sources about how the generation in which the Messiah comes is going to be very technologically advanced. And then we look at the science that we have today. And again, that we're peering back billions of light years. And we are experiencing the the incredible uh, inf- in, uh, infusion of knowledge of creation and the universe like never before and at the same time and again obviously we we didn't he- we didn't hear about these things we didn't read about it at the time of the generation of the flood which is recorded as being the most decadent generation in in history because they didn't have the science and they didn't have the technology where they could actually have a, a state run instituted state backed apparatus for changing people's genders i'm sure they changed people's genders occasionally but it wasn't the way it is today mm-hmm. and so uh, as so we have this this tremendous dichotomy of of scientific advancement where on the one hand we we have the incredible knowledge that we are amassing that can bring us to a greater awareness of the of the creator on the other hand we have science being science supposedly right air quotes being used to utterly destroy humanity and this all reminds me of the uh, source in our sages where we're told that the generation in which Mashiach will arrive is going to be so technologically advanced that it will have the capacity to destroy itself. Right. And so whenever I learned that, I always assumed that it meant the nuclear button. You know, whenever I learned this this illusion in Chazal from thousands of years ago saying that that generation will be able to bring about its own destruction, I assume it meant that someone could push the button. But maybe it it simply means that we that we will have all of these other ways of destroying ourselves and destroying yeah. the, the potential of humanity. The connection that we can make to the Torah Parsha this week, uh, Re'eh, because when it comes to Hashem giving the Torah to Israel, it was to bring it down to earth to bring it into the realm of of impacting our lives uh, daily on how to live and how to grow. This is done by observing, by seeing what is happening in front of you and choosing. We're seeing something that's dreadfully wrong. If you're an adult and you think that you don't want to be a male or female anymore, that's between you and Hashem. Our point being is that when you do it to children, that's that's child abuse. And I, I also want to reiterate again that this is not about a judgment on anybody. This is not my my right to judge anyone or to or to be uh, God forbid hateful of anyone or to be rejecting anyone. That's not what this is conversation is all about. This conversation, it, to me, it's very clear that all of the people that are that are being swept up in this are victims of an agenda of a society that is. That is evil, mm-hmm. and um, and my hope and my prayer is for people to be able to arouse themselves out of this out of this terrible um, hip, hypnotic uh, pull uh, towards destruction that that people are being made to feel that they that they have to uh, you know go along with this because they, like you said it's trendy and 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 we can and this must explain everything and. Rather than understand the fra- the framework and the Torah's teachings about the fact that a human being is a sexual being and there are feelings and that there and there are there are uh, all sorts of feelings that come and go and all sorts of things that can lead to arousal, but that doesn't mean that they have to be acted upon and it doesn't mean that they have to be trusted or or empowered. It, it means that the, the, this entire area of endeavor of human being, the sexual relationships, is a great test and. Uh, the, the 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 place where a person really has to rein in feelings and emotions and um, try to bring everything back to the place that Hashem intended it to be, in which it can be a a, a, a reflection of godliness and of holiness. Yeah. Oh, it's all so horrendous. Let's end on a positive note, yes. which is that Elul is coming, and it's the time for us to. Yes, reverse things, reverse everything, all the directions that we've been straying in and to really reconsider who we want to be, what we want to be, 
and to prepare ourselves as the king is in the field, that beautiful, beautiful metaphor of our sages that the King Hashem himself is so close to us during this month, literally leaning over and listening to us and waiting for us to show him some sign of sincerity, some sign of life, and then he's going to help us to nurture that feeling and to bring it to the forefront and to encourage us to become closer to him and to start the new year off right with Hashem's help. 